to the uh, electrical engineering department for a impromptu presentation that we're really uh, pleased to have. My name is Braun. I'm a professor in the electrical engineering department. And together with the physics department and the Mothers for Peace, we were able to somehow get this uh, chance to happen that uh, Arnie Gunderson would come and give a talk here on campus. So we're really uh, pleased to welcome him with decades of experience with the nuclear power industry, and I'm eager to learn what he has to say. So thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you all for coming. I'm standing here looking at computer engineering, and when I went to college, that didn't even exist. It's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting time to, to be an engineer. Um, I, I went to Rensselaer, and I wanted to get into engineering physics because I wasn't quite an engineer and I wasn't quite a physicist, and that was a, a great combination. And my freshman year, they canceled the program, which drove me into nuclear engineering. And then as nuclear engineering enrollments declined in the 80s, they renamed the department engineering physics. So if I had either gotten there a couple years earlier or a couple years later, I would have been in the uh, discipline I wanted to be in. Uh, so in any way, I, I um, have a bachelor's and master's in, in nuclear, and I was a uh, senior VP in the nuclear industry. And over my 45 years, I've seen um, uh, five meltdowns. And I wanted to share the experience from those five meltdowns with you. OK, so the, the five lessons that I think we should learn from the, the five meltdowns are first, that safety systems will fail. Um, the second is that emergency plans will fail. Uh, the third is that radiation is going to enter the <laughs> groundwater in the event of uh, these failures. Uh, fourth is that people will die. And that fifth is that the risk is grossly <laughs> underestimated. So the first one, that safety systems will fail. When, um, well, when we design a nuclear power plant, uh, designers come up with this term, the maximum credible accident or the design basis accident. and. Uh, they, they come up with uh, criteria that they build a power plant to. Um, an example is that um, at, at Fukushima Daiichi, uh, the designers decided that the wall, the tsunami wall, should be four meters high, about 12 feet. And um, later they raised it to five meters, about 15, 16 feet. Um, so that was the design basis tsunami. Uh, an example at uh, Diablo would be the uh, ground acceleration on the uh, power plant. Um, it's uh, four tenths of, a, of, of, a, of the acceleration of gravity. Um, later, it's been shown to, uh, uh, claimed to be shown to uh, be able to handle a 0.7 G earthquake. But that's a design basis. Um, one of the problems that's happened in, uh, that I've seen in my career is that in every one of these meltdowns, the design basis has been exceeded. So um, yeah, I really can't consider it a design basis anymore. It seems to me that you know, it's not like Moses walks down from the mountain and chiseled in stone are, you know, don't worry, a tsunami's not going to exceed 15 feet. And, and uh, you can base that as the criteria for your, for your design. Uh, the tsunami that hit uh, uh, Fukushima Daiichi was 45 feet high, and the design basis tsunami was was 15 feet. Um, so clearly, design bases are not the worst that Mother Nature can throw at you, but in fact, are the worst that you can afford to, to, to mitigate against. And it really, uh, to my way of thinking, is a financial decision that drives what the design bases can be. And so when we look at safety systems failing, um, at all of these disasters uh, exceeded the design bases. So the first one is Three Mile Island. This is a picture of the core of Three Mile Island. Um, it was taken by, uh, by engineers about a year and a half after the, uh, the meltdown occurred. And to give you an idea how ingrained in engineers' heads 
the impossibility of a meltdown really is. I know the, um, the, the engineers that, that ran this camera into the reactor, and uh, they put the camera down through a hole in the, in the uh, reactor vessel, and they went down the appropriate length to find the core, and they didn't see anything. So they pulled the camera back out, saying, I can't be, something's wrong with our measurements, and they re-measured everything. Um, they went down a second time, put the camera down to the right distance, and um, they didn't see anything. And they pulled the camera back out and remeasured everything again. They put the camera down a third time, and they didn't see anything. And then, and only then, a year and a half after all this radiation was released, they said, oh my gosh, we had a meltdown. And they pushed the camera down further, and this is what they saw. So the second disaster in my lifetime was, I should talk about this first. This is the um, containment pressure at, um, at TMI post-accident. And you'll see one exciting mark on that, that blip in the middle. Around 1 o'clock, there was a hydrogen explosion. Uh, it was so violent that the control room shook and the um, control room uh, operators noticed it. And the, in fact, this spike came off of a pressure indicator in the, uh, uh, in the control room. Uh, if you look at the back end of the spike, here versus here, what that indicates is that before the spike, the containment was holding pressure. It's at a positive pressure. After the spike, it never goes positive again. Why is that? The containment leaked. And what I did is when I was an expert on the, uh, on the trial at Three Mile Island is I went around the containment and I found three radiation detectors that hadn't already gone off scale. And at around 1 o'clock, they all went off scale. So I think there's ample evidence to show that uh, the containment leak. Um, we had an expert on the trial, a guy named Dr. Wrightblatt at the University of Bridgeport, who, based on the shape of that curve, estimated that between 3 and 12, I'm sorry, between 8 and 12 percent of the containment volume uh, leaked in the, in the next six hours. So that's an example of design bases. Uh, the design basis leak for containment is 1% in the first day and a tenth of a percent afterward. And, and here's Three Mile Island leaking at 12%. Uh, at so the next uh, disaster was Chernobyl um, a couple years later, about seven years later. And the, the picture on the right is the molten core. It's called the elephant's foot, sort of looks like it. Uh, it was taken by a robot. Um, and the radiation exposure off of that would be, if it were in this room, we would be dead in less than a minute or two. It's incredibly radioactive, even today, 30 years after the accident. So this is the molten core that, that slumped down uh, through the reactor and into the basement. But the interesting thing here is at this point, it's dry. It's not in contact with, with groundwater. Again, the, uh, the engineers never expected that the people on the shift that night would, uh, would do the things that they did to uh, cause a, a really rapid run up in the power of the reactor. Um, that was beyond the design bases. The next one is, uh, is, is Fukushima Daiichi. And the, the three blocks, the three white blocks are from left to right, um, Daiichi 2, Daiichi 3, and Daiichi 4. There's a little fuzzy spot on the, um, on the far left, and that's uh, Daiichi 1, which had already e exploded. So I want you to take a look at the middle box. Right in that middle frame, you'll see a flash coming off the middle box. And if you, um, if you measure the size of that flash compared to the size of the building, you can get a, um, uh, an estimate of the speed at which that explosion is occurring. There's two different kinds of explosions. There's a, a deflagration, then there's a detonation. Um, unit one uh, had a deflagration. And what that means is that the shock wave from the explosion travels relatively slowly. It travels less than the speed of sound. Um, a detonation, on the other hand, is a shock wave that travels faster than the speed of sound. And a detonation shockwave does a heck of a lot more damage than a deflagration shockwave. 
um, neither shockwave is expected to occur as part of the design basis of a power plant. These were caused by hydrogen buildups, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says hydrogen buildups can't occur. So in my career, we've had five meltdowns, four of which TMI and the three meltdowns at, uh, at, at Fukushima were, were uh, <coughs> after the meltdown began to occur, hydrogen gas was liberated. But yet that's not part of the design basis. And the detonation shockwave is not either. There's not a containment in the world, not Diablo, not the more modern AP-1000 designs. There's not a containment in the world that can withstand what you're looking at, a detonation shockwave. So the, after this, it's, it's, um, it's all ballistic. The, the, the event has happened. But I'll show you uh, 12, 20 slides in a row that take about three seconds in real life uh, to watch the damage that can be caused by a detonation shockwave. That's pieces of the roof falling down. Another example of containment leaking. Now remember, Three Mile Island uh, leaked. You can tell by the shape of the, uh, the curve after the explosion. This is a, a Tokyo Electric infrared picture of um, Fukushima Daiichi Unit 3. And the, um, it was taken a month after the accident. And the, the big blotch that kind of catches your eye in the center is the spent fuel pool, which is, uh, which is boiling, but it's mixing with air. And the gases over the spent fuel pool are at about 62 degrees centigrade, about 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that's the spent fuel pool. But if you look right next to it, and these are, this is TEPCO data now. If you look right next to it, that's 128C. And because this is an engineering school, I don't have to explain that water boils at 100. So what you're seeing there is not steam. It's hot radioactive gases. There might be some water vapor in it, but it's hot radioactive gases. It's another example of a gross containment failure that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission doesn't assume can happen in, a, uh, uh, in their design bases for any power plant. So I guess my conclusion based on Three Mile Island and um, um, the three, the three meltdowns of Fukushima Daiichi are that the, the design bases that America uses and the world uses really don't adequately address containment failure. Another example of, of a design basis that was uh, exceeded is what we call the Lewis or loss of the ultimate heat sink. And along the water, at Fukushima Daiichi were pump houses. And there's four pump houses for Daiichi 1, 2, 3, and 4. And they're designed to suck cold water out of the ocean to cool things like the diesels and to cool things like the suppression pool, which had water in it that was needed to be recirculated through the nuclear reactor. So these pumps were destroyed by the tsunami. So what does that mean? We've all heard that the tsunami came in unimaginably high, flooded the diesels. The diesels didn't work. And it's because somebody was dumb enough to put the diesels in the basement that we had this disaster. That's not true. Even if the diesels were sitting on top of the Empire State Building, they would have been destroyed anyway by this thing called the loss of the ultimate heat sink. You know, when you blow the water pump on your car, the engine seizes up. When you blow the water pump on, uh, on, on an emergency diesel, the emergency diesel seizes up. So the emergency diesels at Fukushima Daiichi would not have worked, even if they weren't flooded, because the tsunami took out the cooling pumps along the ocean. It's interesting, a whistleblower contacted me, and he said, we knew that was going to happen. And on Fukushima Daini, we, we changed the design, and we put in what's called submersible pumps. But we never went back to Daiichi and made that change. So moving on to the, the second point was that emergency plans will fail. Um, let, let's talk about Three Mile Island briefly. Um, I was an expert on the Three Mile Island trial. And um, 
uh, my point was that there should have been an evacuation based on the plant's written procedures at about 7.30 in the morning of the first day of the, uh, uh, of the disaster. Um, what happened was that um, uh, the plant overrode its own procedures. Uh, there was a radiation monitor in the containment. And um, if that monitor exceeded a certain level, you were supposed to um, evacuate, and they overrode their own procedures. Um, afterward, um, Governor Thornburg uh, was not advised of the high radiation in the, uh, in the containment, nor was he advised of that hydrogen explosion I, I told you about. He was told that everything was under control. As an, as an expert for the, the plaintiffs, I was arguing that um, uh, it was wrong, that, that the staff at Three Mile Island should have notified the governor and the NRC. The NRC didn't know about that either. And that had they known um, the information that was available to the plant staff, an evacuation would have occurred on the very first day. As a matter of fact, three hours after the, uh, after the disaster began. Well, what um, uh, I, I also was a keynote speaker at Penn State last year for the 35th anniversary of, the, uh, of that disaster. And I, it was Governor Thornburg and I were the, the two keynotes. He was the first keynote, I was the last, and there were speakers in between. And I got to talk to Governor Thornburg after his speech. And I said, you know, Governor, you were lied to by, by the, the people that ran Three Mile Island. And then he paused, and he looked at me for about 10 seconds. He says, yeah, you're right, I was lied to. I said, do you realize there was just one barrier between you and a, dis and a real disaster in that entire Susquehanna uh, uh, Valley? And uh, uh, he said, uh, yeah, I realize that. And I said, well, that one barrier, which was the containment, it did leak, but it didn't completely fail. So I said to him, I said, do you realize if that one barrier had failed, um, you would have had a, an unmitigated disaster on your hands? And uh, he said, yeah, I know. And I said, well, knowing that, would you have ordered an evacuation? And he said, no. He said, I was much more worried about the public being afraid uh, than, than evacuating people. Ultimately, two, two days later, on the advice of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, he had a voluntary evacuation of women and children. But those two days were, uh, that were make or break time. All the iodine was released, and all of the noble gases were released. Um, and um, we'll get to the consequences of that a little later. So that was one example of emergency planning. Of course, we all know uh, about Chernobyl. And uh, in Chernobyl, the, um, um, the, the government was running the, op the, the reactor and uh, did not evacuate the, the, the nearby towns, let alone Kiev, and actually didn't even talk to Moscow for the better part of half a day. Um, the world became aware of the disaster of Chernobyl because workers in Sweden were walking in through the parking lot, which was contaminated, and into a Swedish power plant, and they were coming to work contaminated. When they went through the radiation portal, they came to work contaminated. That's how the world found out about, uh, uh, about Chernobyl. And, and thank God for Voice of America. Voice of America got on and, and told the, the people in the Eastern Bloc uh, to take iodine. And uh, the, 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 the health effects are significant at Chernobyl already. But were it not for Voice of America uh, warning people about the need to, to take iodine pills, um, it, would have been, it would have been much worse. And of course, Fukushima Daiichi, um, the Japanese did not evacuate out anywhere near far enough. When, when they, they did, did evacuate, they, they sent people into, into the direction where the radioactive plume was. And they had iodine pills, but, but the, the towns didn't release them until the government said it was okay, which was seven days later. So, so we, we have, have all these plans, plans. They, they just are implemented. implemented. And so I conclude that uh, emergency planning will fail when you get a, a disaster. The, uh, the next, next point, point is that radiation will enter the groundwater. Um, uh, TMI is the exception. There's water in the basement, um, but has not entered the groundwater yet. But of course, Chernobyl, uh, water has, radiation has entered the groundwater. And they're building a huge $5 billion cover, which they will slide over the power plant in order to keep the elements away from the nuclear core. Um, 
but uh, the, the fear is that uh, unless, in, and that cover is designed to last for 100 years. Uh, after 100 years, they've got to go in and get that core, or else they'll begin to contaminate the, uh, um, the, the water supply from Kiev and, and other yeah. things. Yeah. And of course, then we've got Daiichi. And uh, Daiichi, uh, the, the, the nuclear reactor cores have melted through the, the nuclear reactors. Think of a pressure cooker. They've melted through the pressure cooker and they're lying on the floor of the nuclear containment. Um, the, it's uncertain how far they've gone down, but we know they're, they're working their way in now through chemical reactions, but initially through an enormous amount of heat, and they're working with their way down through this concrete. But it doesn't matter if the, if the containment has been breached um, because the core is melted down. What happened was that the, the heat and the radiation levels and the high temperature have destroyed all of the, um, the rubber gaskets that go around the pipes and the wires that go in and out of the containment. So the containment is leaking uh, through the sidewalls where these pipes come in. Now the, uh, the integrity of the, the rubber caulking around the, uh, the pipe is shot and water's coming in and water's going out. Now we've known that in the United States for 30 years. Uh, I was pointed to a report uh, back from 1982 where the Nuclear Regulatory Commission identified that as a, as a real possibility that you could get the, uh, um, the heat plus the pressure plus the radiation levels were so significant that the rubber gaskets are, um, are, are damaged to the point where water's coming in and water's going out. So it doesn't, you know, we have this term China syndrome which is where the nuclear reactor core melts down to China. And I think if you're in Japan, it doesn't go to China, it goes somewhere else. But that, that's not an engineering term. But it doesn't matter if the core has melted through the containment. I don't think it has. But there's so much in leakage into the containment and out leakage that effectively we're contaminating the, uh, the groundwater as well. Daiichi's released the equivalent of 25,000 of these truckloads of radioactively contaminated water into the Pacific Ocean already. And um, in an attempt to mitigate it, the, uh, the Japanese have built a wall, and that wall is now failing from the pressure of the groundwater. We really shouldn't be surprised, but the wall has buckled about, uh, about 10 inches at the top already. So we've released 25,000 tractor trailer loads of radioactive, radioactively contaminated water into the Pacific already, with more to come. Now, the real lesson from Daiichi is what if that happened on the Danube, or the Rhine, or the Mississippi, or the Missouri? Now, the Pacific is a big place, so this radiation is being diluted. We used to, what I learned was dilution is the solution to pollution. Um, uh, but, you know, of course, the, even now, with a huge body of water to, to, to dilute the radiation, we're still seeing it off the California coast. So, um, that containments will leak into groundwater should be a factor in the design of, of, of future power plants. And if we are actually lucky that this is leaking into the Pacific and not the Rhine or the Danube or the Mississippi, you'd have to shut the Mississippi down. Uh, or the Great Lakes, there's 40 power plants along the Great Lakes. Um, the, uh, the health consequences to a huge portion of the population of, of continents uh, can be jeopardized by uh, by a meltdown. And should you be worried, my, my position is yes, that the consequences um, are grossly underestimated of the water entering the groundwater. All right, the, the next one is that, uh, that people will die. Um, this is Dr. Steve Wing. Um, Steve is an epidemiologist at UNC, University of North Carolina. And he and I spoke at uh, the New York Academy of Medicine's uh, conference on, on the uh, Daiichi disaster. And uh, it was the second anniversary, 2013. Now, Steve was an epidemiologist who plotted the cancer data from Three Mile Island. So the other part of this picture um, shows a white line going from the upper left to the lower right. That's the Susquehanna River. And if you look along the Susquehanna River, this is a peer-reviewed report, by the way, 
Um, if you look along the Susquehanna River, you'll see red, and then to the sides of it, you'll see green. And what Steve was able to show is that the, the lung cancer incidence is twice as high or more in the river valley compared to the hills. And why is that? There was a temperature inversion that day. And the, the air sat in the valley. And it, um, uh, it didn't make it up into the hillsides. So uh, Steve uh, used, you know, published data to come up with this. And uh, this happens, cancer, lung cancer data was the only data Steve could get his hands on. But it clearly shows a, a, a doubling, if not more, of cancer incidents for the people that lived in the Susquehanna Valley. This is Dr. Alexei Yablokov. Now, Yablokov was um, the science advisor to Boris Yeltsin after Gorbachev and the fall of the, uh, uh, of the Soviet Union. So he was a, um, this is when we had Russia, and he was Boris, Boris Yeltsin's uh, science advisor. And uh, Yablokov has written a book along with two other people uh, that is, has been published by the New York Academy of Medicine. And uh, uh, he's calculating something on the order of a million cancers as a result of, uh, of the Chernobyl disaster. Now, the IAEA in the nuclear industry is saying about 40 people. So clearly there's a, uh, and I should go back to Three Mile Island. If you go up on the NRC's webpage, uh, they'll say nobody died after Three Mile Island. What happened was that the insurance company settled. And in today's dollars, they gave away about $100 million to people that had lost. And, uh, uh, but as part of the deal, they had to sign that they weren't talking about. So the data that we've got uh, out of Three Mile Island is the epidemiological data is only wings, and uh, all of the uh, all of the people who suffered losses were uh, were compensated to the tune of in today's dollars about a hundred million about a hundred million dollars. So Yablokov is up here at a million and the people roughly, and um, uh, the IAEA is around forty. Um, uh, clearly, there's a, a huge difference. And it depends on, on who you talk to. Um, this, is, this is Dr. Yuri Van Um Yuri discovered something called Chernobyl heart. And um, what he, he was uh, tinkering with mice in a lab. And uh, he noticed that when uh, mice were given cesium, um, it affected the way their hearts grow. And your heart, I, I learned a lot about medicine over the years here. Your heart, the number of, um, of cells in your heart is established when you're, when you're extraordinarily young. Um, and um, it doesn't grow after that, which is one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of heart cancers, because the cells are not dividing. Uh, but they do get, um, but in infants, their hearts are, are deformed and sometimes fatally deformed. Sorry. When Bandachevsky saw this happen uh, at Chernobyl, he published a paper about Chernobyl hearts in the, in the children around there. Um, they arrested him and threw him in jail for seven years. Um, ultimately, the EU um, uh, prevailed and he was released from jail after three years. But all of his data and all of his specimens have been destroyed. So it's, a, it's, a, it's tough to be a scientist in, uh, in what was the Eastern Bloc in, in Ukraine and surrounding areas when you know that when you publish, you're going to be thrown in jail. The charges were that he uh, had accepted money from his students to inflate their grades. No students testified against him, but two parents said it had happened. Uh, his bank account reflected no increase in money. Uh, and yet on the basis of oral testimony of two parents with no evidence, the guy was thrown in jail for seven years. So thank God for his colleagues in the EU for, for turning that around. So when you look at the data that the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, is, is evaluating it on, they don't include people like Bandashevsky and all of his colleagues who are obviously a little bit of afraid to, uh, to publish. The last point is, the, is how we estimate risk. In the, in the nuclear industry, um, when, if you assume that a containment doesn't leak and you assume that people can go back to their homes in a very short period of time, um, that's, that's the costs of the accident are routinely incredibly underestimated. Um, 
The NRC assumes uh, the loss of a life at around um, $3 million. The EPA assumes $6 million. So the NRC undervalues the loss of a life compared to other, other federal agencies. So, and, and also the loss of property. You know, if you believe that the farmer's fields are going to be farmed uh, the next year, the economic losses are essentially insignificant. But if you look at, uh, at, at Fukushima, where, you know, we can't, there's 160 million, 160,000 people displaced uh, for five years, that, away from their, uh, the, the land that they used to grow rice on, um, those costs are grossly underestimated. So the, the, uh, the cost of a uh, disaster are underestimated. But the other piece of it is that the probability of an accident is grossly underestimated as well. Um, for instance, if you look at the five meltdowns in 35 years, Three Mile Island was roughly 35 years ago, 35 divided by five is seven. So about once a decade, history tells us there's going to be a nuclear meltdown. Well, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will say that the probability of a meltdown is around one in a million per reactor year. So there's 400 nuclear reactors, a million divided by 400, so that there should be one meltdown every 2,500 years. Well, if you're a policymaker, you can, you can bet that your, your district will be safe if the chance is one in 25,000, one in 2,500 years. But if you thought that somewhere in the world a, a, a nuclear meltdown was going to occur once a decade, uh, policymakers might have a different view of the problem. So this is, uh, th this is why the analysis is wrong, in my opinion. Um, we have this thing called probabilistic risk assessment, uh, PRA. I call it prey. Um, but the, the, the probabilistic risk assessment, it's like, uh, what are the chances of drawing an ace in a, in a deck of cards? Right, there's four aces, there's 52 cards, it's about 1 in 13. We know that, that's, that's good statistics. But if you don't know how many cards are in the deck, if you don't know how many cards are in the pile, you, you can't make that determination. And that's the problem with nuclear power plants. We don't know all the things we don't know. We don't know all the possible ways that a, a nuclear power plant can fail. Um, and so what that does is has the effect of underestimating the probability of a, of a meltdown. And, it un and, and of course, we underestimate the consequences of a meltdown. When you assume a containment leaks 1% in the first day and then a tenth of a percent after that, that's a lot different than what the NRC said. Daiichi, according to an NRC uh, telephone call uh, two weeks after the accident, was leaking at 300% a day. So essentially every eight hours, the radioactive gases in Daiichi were being released. Well, if you use that number, you'll come up with an entirely different um, scenario than you would if you use the uh, uh, much less uh, conservative numbers that, that they, uh, we use when we license and when we relicense a power plant today. So the, again, the points for accidents will happen. I was saying, um, sooner or later, in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the proofs. <laughs> and, and it's happened you know, five times in my, in my career. Um, the, the groundwater will be contaminated. Emergency plans, even if they're written well, won't be implemented. And that the, uh, the consequences are grossly uh, uh, underestimated. I got to know uh, Nehru Khan Who's the, um, uh, who was the prime minister of Japan when the disasters happened at, at Fukushima. And by the way, he's an engineer. He was not a nuclear engineer, but he was an engineer. And um, um, I, I, we, we were on several speaking tours together. And Khan um, uh, is vilified in Japan for not evacuating soon enough, uh, especially in Fukushima prefecture, which is like a state, a prefecture. So in the state of, of Fukushima, uh, he's vilified. And I said to him, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, um, I, I put myself in your shoes. And uh, um, no one was telling you the truth. I, I said, 
Now, Tokyo Electric was not telling you the truth, nor was your own regulator, uh, METI, the, the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Um, so given the information you were getting, I said, I think you made the right decision. And he turned to me and he said, you know, thank you, because not many people feel he made the right decision. He said, thank you. He said, the information I received was neither timely nor accurate. So when your policymakers are stuck, and, and the same thing happened to Thornburg at Three Mile Island, the same thing happened to the uh, Soviets at Fukushima, when the, uh, at Chernobyl, uh, the same thing happened to the Soviets at Chernobyl, um, uh, Thornburg at TMI, and, uh, and Naoto Khan in, in Japan, when the people operating the plant don't tell you the truth, and when the people regulating the plant help to cover it up, well, you have a problem. And you're not going to implement the evacuation plans uh, soon enough. Um, and then, of course, the last piece of that was that the, uh, the frequency of a, uh, of a disaster is underestimated, and the consequences are underestimated, which drives plants to be relicensed for an extra 20 years, and it drives um, decisions to build new nuclear power plants as well. The latest generation of power plants, um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has a set of uh, assumptions in them that talks about you won't even need an emergency plan because they're, uh, they're sure that none of the radiation will leave the site boundary. And uh, we're seeing that now down at San Onofre uh, where the San Onofre's been allowed to uh, eliminate its emergency planning because while it's got the equivalent of 700 nuclear weapons worth of fuel in the spent fuel pool, the reactor's not running anymore. So the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has allowed them to collapse the emergency planning zone down to just the site itself. But at the same time, they're still allowed to maintain their Price-Anderson insurance. And Price-Anderson insurance means that if there is a need to evacuate, you and I are gonna pay the cost. So my position is if you want to collapse the emergency plan down to the site boundary, like we are planning to do on these small modular reactors that are 20 miles and 20 uh, years in the future, or like we're doing on plants once they've shut down, the uh, utility that owns them should be required to renounce its price Anderson insurance as well. Um, why should the citizens pick up the risk and the, uh, and, and the costs be, uh, uh, be minimized for the people that own it? My last, uh, last point is I spoke with Naoto Khan, and he said Japan's existence as a country was jeopardized. And I've read Gorbachev's memoirs, and Gorbachev blames the collapse of the Soviet Union on, not on perestroika, but on Chernobyl. So think about that. You're dealing with a, with a technology that, when it goes wrong, has the chance of wiping out a country overnight. And the, the two people that face that, Chernobyl with uh, Gorbachev and uh, Naoto Khan in Japan, plus three other previous prime ministers in Japan, all say that going down a nuclear route in the future is a mistake. Um, so the, the people that have you know, looked the dragon in the eye have come away convinced that this is not a viable solution for, for future energy problems. But that's the topic of another talk. So I'll um, leave it open to questions. And I have a question, and it, and it, probably there's not an answer, but I think the science and the technology is on the side of everything that you said, and I think the risks are, are, are there, the risks are great, and that sort of thing. And, and yet, the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they, they make these sort of outlandish uh, statements about the, the risk and that sort of thing, and, and they always get away with it. But, the science never supports what they say. What, it, what, what can be done about it? Is there anything that can be done about something like that? It's, as, I'm also an engineer. As an engineer, it frustrates me to well, see that sort of thing. Uh, I, I can give you two examples to support that before I, I give you a, uh, a potential answer. I, um, I was Friends of the Earth expert on, on San Onofre, and we filed something called a 2.206 petition. And uh, uh, in July of 2012, the, the tubes blew in, um, in January of 2012. So we filed, and the rights of citizens to petition the NRC is through this thing called the 2.206. And um, so 
Um, it took the NRC six months to convene a petition review board, so now we're into January of 2013. And I had a two-hour PowerPoint presentation in front of the petition review board. And the chairman of the petition review board fell asleep twice during my presentation. Um, but that's, there's a problem there. <laughs> um, and then um, the NRC is required to let you know six months afterward. And what happened was that they waited until 2015 to release their decision. And their decision was that since the plan had already shut down, the issue was moot and they didn't have to make a decision. Um, so that's, uh, th that's an example of what, what we all run into in this industry. The, the problem, in, in my opinion, is that the, uh, uh, the commissioners, the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is run by five commissioners. And the uh, five commissioners are appointed by Congress. And uh, the chairman is um, of the political affiliation of whatever party is, has the White House. So there's five guys. Uh, you have two Dems and three Republicans, or, or two Republicans and three Dems. Um, but they're appointed by Congress. But every one of them is vetted by NEI, Nuclear Energy Institute, the, uh, the, the lobbying group for, for nuclear power. So you don't get into the commissioner's role uh, unless you're approved by the lobbying group that's pushing uh, nuclear power. So the five people at the top have, um, uh, you know, they've already been signed, sealed, and delivered by the nuclear industry. Then you get down to the staff level. Um, at the worker bee level, I think there's a lot of really uh, honest uh, engineers and, and scientists. To, but to work your way up into management, uh, decisions uh, become co-opted. And uh, to work your way into high management, where when you leave, you wind up with a great job at a utility. Um, you, uh, you, you wind up uh, you know, thinking like utilities. There's a, uh, the, the concept is called regulatory capture. And oh, there's actually a book on it, an old book on it. But it seems like when a regulator gets started, they have the best intentions. But over time, the agency, uh, the people at the agency are supposed to regulate, build a wall around it. So, uh, and bureaucrats being bureaucrats, don't mind being trapped in, in the wall. Um, what you can do about it is, is contact your, your congressman and your senators and say, it's unacceptable. Um, I was, um, uh, I, I applied three times to be on a thing called the Advisory Committee for Reactor Safeguards. It's 17 wise people, there's 4,000 staff, there's 17 wise people, and there's these five commissioners. So I applied to be um, uh, them. I had uh, 56 environmental organizations supporting my application, and then uh, it was rejected. So, you know, that it just, uh, you know, you've gotten a structure that dates back from Manhattan Project and things like that. And this issue of, of secrecy and a priesthood, you know, the, there's an, the term is an atomic priesthood, um, they, uh, which is actually, um, was invented by a, a, a pro-nuclear person back in the 60s, and I think quoted by Barry Common, but this atomic priesthood feels that only it can read the text in Latin and the rest of us have to just, just go along. Uh, it's, it's frightening. Uh, then uh, the only solution is to lobby Congress. And frankly, the, the nuclear industry spent $670 million on lobbying in the last 10 years. That's 600 million on lobbyists and 70 million in direct campaign contributions to, to, to uh, various senators and congressmen. So, uh, you know, the one way to change it is to come up with $670 million. <laughs> but, but short of that, it's a, it's a stack deck. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the times the commission uh, has shut a nuclear power plant down have been zero. Um, the, the ones they sort of claim happened was, uh, was Susquehanna back in the 80s. And what happened there was the plant was running and their, their resident inspector walked into the control room and found at night and found all five reactor operators asleep. And uh, that was enough for them to shut it down for, th for three years until they got their act together. But short of that, when a power plant has already shut down, some of them they haven't allowed to start back up until they clean up things. But it's never been that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission said, you've got to shut down. Um, the um, General Accounting Office did a study on, which I can't remember the reactor, but one of these that had shut down, and they said, 
the NRC had 54 items that had to be uh, cleaned up before they started up. And the GAO said 44 of them you knew about before it ever shut down. Why didn't you shut it down earlier? And of course, there was no, no response to that. So it's an uphill uh, fight for citizens to, uh, uh, to have an impact on the agency. This 2.206 process that I talked about, um, every single 2.206 has been rejected. Uh, you know, some of them are uh, like, uh, they accept a tiny piece and then reject the, the lion's share of it. When, when I was a nuclear whistleblower in the 90s, and um, what our family went through is time for another speech, but um, the inspector general did a study of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and 700 people had filed whistleblower complaints with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. 2% were investigated, so of the 700, 14 were investigated, and three fines were issued, and nobody went to jail. Um, it's, a, it's an uphill battle. Yeah. And uh, isn't a large part of the NRC's budget from the nuclear industry? Yeah, the, the, the question was, is that we don't, the question was, uh, how is the NRC funded? 90% um, of the NRC's budget is from um, taxes on the power plants that it oversees. If, you, um, um, if you're in trouble, if a power plant's in trouble and an inspector has to be flown out, the NRC charges uh, 285 bucks an hour for that inspector to be there. Um, so only 10% of the budget is paid for out of, uh, out of taxes. Um, and um, now with power plants shutting down, five power plants have shut down in the last, um, the last two years, with two, two more scheduled to shut down in the next two years. The, the, the NRC staff realizes that, oh my God, if we have fewer power plants, there's gonna be fewer of us. So I think there's pressure on the staff to, uh, uh, to continue uh, uh, with the rubber stamp. Yeah. Wasn't there a time that Congress was, that, that the NRC was more uh, pushing more enforcement action and didn't Congress intervene? What, what's? Yeah. Um, in his book, um, I know Shirley Jackson was the commissioner and uh, Dominici. Uh, Dominici. Pete Do Dominici was the, uh, uh, was the head of the oversight panel. And he actually talks about this, he's proud in his book that he threatened um, uh, Leslie, I'm sorry, he, he threatened Jackson with cutting her budget unless she was easier on the power plants. And um, son of a gun, uh, she became easier on the power plants. Uh, so it's in Dominici's book. Um, he actually has a rather lengthy discussion of how proud he was to get the, uh, the NRC to kowtow to the industry. Yeah. Hi. My name is Steven Zawalik. Uh, I'm a community member here. Um, I grew up in the nuclear industry and been a reactor operator and for 30 years. Um, I come to these things and listen all the time. It's always interesting. I like helping people and I'm happy to answer any questions for anyone after the meeting. But um, today, you know, I have, two, I have one question and, uh, and I just want to comment real quickly. Um, quality of information is amazingly important. It's very, very easy to blur the lines between truth and lie and walk the gray area in between. And I have rarely seen such an eloquent speaker, such an educated person, blur those lines so much in my experience. I could find very little of what you said that I could 100% agree with, very little. And very much of what you said I could agree with almost at, at, at all, none. Zero. So my only question for you is, how much do you get paid to do this? Yeah. Uh, I'm on Social Security. I get nothing. But you're running this business. It's a nonprofit. Yeah. The you nonprofit. I work free. for free. Really? Yep. How much do you get paid? Well, my, my <laughs> salary. I have, a, I have my own business on the side, and I do work for PG&E, but that's irrelevant. Because yeah. well, when you it's get money, what he makes, but it's irrelevant what you make working for nuclear industry. Yeah, I, they, <laughs> when they give you the money, they don't say you, and you have to do everything you say. Where, you where, just, where do you just let go unless you do? That's oh, understood. Let me just jump in. That's not true at all. As another employee of the Yellowstone Power Plant, 
I'm here on my own time, again, at, at my own will, and I've never been encouraged to attend one of these meetings or told your job is on the line or you need to attend these things. That's, the company makes the information available. I'm happy to come on the rare occasions that I do. And Mr. Gunderson, I thank you for supporting something you should believe in on your own time and on your own time. And I'm sure Stephen feels the same way. And I can tell you, as, as the founder of Fairwinds, I'm Maggie Gunderson, that um, we lost everything when he blew the whistle. We both came from the nuclear industry. I was in charge of public relations and proposed nuclear plans. And I can tell you that the NRC did not support us. We ended up losing our home, our savings, our pensions, and maybe you won't be honest with your communities when you find a violation, but when we found them, we were honest, and we stand behind that integrity, and maybe you just stand behind your paycheck. That's I my understand opinion. you're very angry. No, I'm not angry. I'm offended by your belief that somehow we didn't speak the truth, and I can tell you that we did, and every single thing he talked about today is backed with science, real science, the science that's out there and not the nuclear gamesmanship. I could go through that entire slide deck and give another one hour speech explaining how almost everything you said was not totally true. And you're seeing the wrong data, because ours is all peer reviewed. I got, to, I got to talk to the advisory committee on reactor safeguards, so 17 wise, wise guys, wise men. Um, and I think now there's a woman on board, but they, they were wise men at the time. And two, in, in, in 2010, um, and I was arguing about something called net positive suction head and um, how in reactors like Fukushima Daiichi, the containments would leak. Um, and um, uh, they gave me two hours, and I had a, it's up on the, the site, there's a discussion of containment integrity on, on the Fairwind site. And the, um, um, they, uh, they, they listened and said, thank you very much. And then the staff got up. And I clearly showed that there's been 39 containment failures and liner breaches, including uh, a crack uh, right through the wall of the containment at, at Fitzpatrick. And I said, you can't assume this thing called net positive suction that will, will provide the pressure to, to drive the pumps post-accident. And the com then the staff got up after me, actually the next month, and, and said, we assume no containment leaks. And, and so here's the data from Daiichi that shows that, um, that, that we were right. It wasn't just me, it was the state engineer of Vermont, um, and it was Dave Lockbaum at Union Concerned Scientists. Uh, it's an uphill battle when you have all the data on your side. Yes? Um, I'm kind of bordering uh, between agreeing with both sides in the sense of there's unacceptable consequences that can't be measured, but then there's also kind of a need, a need to produce energy and uh, societal demands of as technology changes and whatnot. And kind of like similar to how LA has horrible public transit because we didn't start the process earlier, we're in a position where we have the alternatives are coal and, and fossil fuels. And so I kind of joke around with some of my friends sometimes. I, I know that there are other alternatives, but they're not equal. There's a binary decision of either it's, it's good or it's unacceptable and it has to stop. And I'm wondering if there's any kind of groups that are more, let's use nuclear as a gateway in order to progress towards something that's more sustainable and complete, like without any type of waste, whether it's greenhouse gas or uh, used fuel. Because if we shut down all the plants, I don't know what would replace it. And I know with Germany, it's been, and a lot of my points are anecdotal, but yep. with Germany, it's been replaced by fossil fuels and then the emissions go up. Um, I love the idea of wind power and solar. I don't see the feasibility tomorrow. I see the feasibility in 30 years. And so what I like would be a group that's not getting dismissed as easily. Because I feel like when, they're, when you are going hard on one side, uh, you just get dismissed by people who disagree with you. And if you go hard on the other, like no, no one is, no one that's, uh, I have a, a lot of environmentalist family members. So 
if I have any kind of pro-nuclear sentiment, which I see as a sympathizer to the nuclear industry, I'm a conservative sellout. With my conservative friends, I'm a liberal nut job. So, oh well, that's life. But um, I have a hard time fully supporting a company that's saying the environmentalists don't understand science, and I have a hard time fully supporting environmentalists that say the scientists are liars. So, do you know of any other ones that are kind of more in the middle? Yeah, well, uh, I'd like to think I'm in the middle. Don't, uh, <clears throat> until 20, until the disaster at Fukushima, I actually said that nuclear should be a bridge. Uh, and in 2009, I co-signed a report with, with five other nuclear experts allowing Vermont Yankee to run for another 20 years. So, you know, I can't be in that anti-nuclear wax job category you were, you were talking about. Um, I, I gave a speech at uh, Northwestern University a couple months ago. And uh, there's two points. The first is that um, the nuclear industry would have you believe that mankind is smart enough to store radioactive waste for a quarter of a million years. But that same people would have you believe that humankind is so dumb, we can't figure out how to store solar electricity overnight. You know, that, that, that's either we're smart enough to do both or we're dumb enough to do neither. Here, the, the other point is uh, I'm not really advocating plants you know, shut down. I, I built these things. You know, the, but the concept, the, the paradigm of the, of the 20th century, that we needed large central station power plants, is disintegrating in the 21st century. Just like you know, cell towers have replaced the central station with the, with the you know, operator pushing the thing. But it, so we're seeing a paradigm shift. You know, when I did my thesis, um, God, the computer was three times as big as this room. It was an IBM 360. With, uh, and it took two minutes for my, my, my thesis to run on it and all that kind of stuff. And now my laptop has more power. So the computer's changing the, the energy paradigm in my mind. Um, and what we're finding is that um, the, uh, I just boil it down to cost. Uh, a new nuke in, in, uh, in uh, England uh, at, at Hinkley Point is scheduled to go to be built two new nukes for $32 billion dollars and the bus bar cost, that's the, the, as it enters the grid, it doesn't include distribution through the grid or transmission or anything like that, but as it leaves the power plant, the bus bar cost is, is uh, quoted at 16 cents. Now, that, that's just the cost to produce the power as, as it leaves, and that's guaranteed. Uh, the UK has signed a contract for 35 years plus escalation at 16 cents. So. Um, then we've got a, a, a power plant in, uh, in Virginia, uh, North Down 3, that's at a single unit, which is at $19 billion for a single unit. We had two power plants in, uh, uh, in Florida, Levy County, they were $24 billion for two power plants. Um, let's look at Florida as an example. Um, Florida was planning to build four AP1000 power plants, and two at Levy County and two at Turkey Point, Turkey Point 6 and 7. Um, and um, the total cost of those plants was $48 billion, which was more than the capital cost of every power plant in, the, in Florida. Not just the nukes in Florida, but all the power plants in Florida. So the total cost to build those four nukes was, was $48 billion. And the um, increase in output in Florida was 8%. So it's too costly. If you spent that $48 billion going around and putting double pane windows on, you would, you would have a lot bigger impact and wouldn't need the 8% generation. So the, what's happening in this energy paradigm, I'll get to you, uh, what's happening in the energy paradigm is new costs are not decreasing, they're going up. Um, the Vogel plants are an example of that. Uh, it was claimed that modular construction would lower the cost and, and they're three years behind schedule and three billion over budget already. And, and solar's plummeting, and, and the same with wind. But what we're seeing now is the bus bar cost for wind at about three cents, and the bus bar cost for uh, solar at about five cents, compared to what we've got at Hinkley Point at 16 cents. Now, the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. So you get to um, Tesla and the Powerwall batteries, and those numbers are coming in at around five or six cents to store it. So if you take three cents for wind and six cents for Tesla, heading down, I might add, um, you're at less than 10 cents 
And you've got the 24-7 the, the power. You've got power to get you through the night. And uh, compared to um, the same with solar, five, five and five or five and six, you get 11 cents for solar that runs all the time compared to 16 cents for new nuke. So I did, it's, an, it's an economic argument. And it's this thing called um, uh, cost, um, uh, opportunity cost. Um, if you spend uh, those $48 billion on those power plants in Florida, that's $48 billion you can't spend elsewhere. And the power plants take 10 to 15 years to build versus slapping up solar in, in less than a year. So you lose the opportunity to spend that on a, another low carbon alternative. Um, so I, I just, for new nukes going forward, I, I just boil it down to an economic argument. They just can't compete. Um, and, and I'm not advocating, you know, we've got 99 power plants, shutting them down tomorrow. That's, you know, I built these plants. And, and I think the, the grid instabilities of losing plants you know, in an overnight decision would be significant. But uh, at the same time, I think they should be replaced when, they're, when their useful life is, is over. I had a question back here, and we've been here a little over an hour, so I'll let people go. But yeah? Are you familiar with uh, I'm sorry, am I familiar with? No. Solar uh, thermal station. It's on the uh, California border, uh, no. Nevada, on the way to Vegas. Um, solar array produces three towers, central towers, and these three fields, array fields, produces, uh, has a nameplate capacity of somewhere around 377 meg uh, megawatts uh, and um, costs $2.2 billion to build. $6 billion dollars from taxpayers uh, to build this thing. Google threw in uh, over $100 million, another company threw in $200 million, $300 million, something like that. Um, if you look at the plant's operating uh, efficiency, its, it's capacity factor, it's only in the 31% range, which means that over the course of the year, it's only going to operate 31% of the time. So it's very intermittent. Uh, it's not going to operate at night. It's going to operate if the clouds fly over. Uh, you, lose, you lose capacity, obviously. So uh, comparing that to, say, Diablo, that produces 2,200 megawatts two units together um, at a 90% capacity factor, that gives you a yearly output. Uh, Diablo has a six, is 16 times higher yearly output than that solar fuel. That costs two point two billion dollars. So, if you're going to talk dollar to dollar, dollar to dollar, you build that. You build that. You'd have to build sixteen of those solar fields, which would cost thirty-five billion dollars to get the same capacity as what the Apple produces. Yeah, I, I, you know, I guess they equated solar panels in the state of California and anywhere. The one that the, the, the project that was just built in state of the art. It's not. It's an old design. It is. They just finished it. it solar. Photovoltaics are so much. Now listen, if that plant breaks, what happens? Nothing, right? If a nuclear plant breaks, everybody in the vicinity is in big trouble. Here's something from the Orange County Register. This is Southern California Edison, their recent report, right? They said, let's look on the bright side of the premature shutdown that's costing consumers uh, and shareholders billions of dollars. To, to decommission San Onofre because the thing was about to blow its lid. It sits on the ocean, vulnerable to tsunamis. You know, it's going to cost $9 billion minimum. That's the decommission. And then we're going to be left with radioactive material stuck in these glass casks on the ocean. Glass, glass, steel and concrete. Steel and concrete casks. For but they're going to be there so the forever and ever and people. ever. And ever. The costs that you're discussing are the, the, the cost to replace the model. Well, they had a secret meeting in Poland to break the Public Utility Commission. So the shareholders face the greatest percentage of the cost. Now that's in litigation. So the, the, so that the uh, rate payers would pay $3.6 billion of the estimated $4.8 billion. But that's all out the window now because they were caught with their hand in the cookie jar and the head of the PUC was fired. And, and if there's any justice on this planet, 
that the Vice President of Southern California Edison and the head of the PUC, PD, will go to prison for, you know, being liars and cheats and, and stabbing the public in the back. These plants are tremendously expensive to build. And the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant, you talked about the solar plants don't work at night. They had to build a Helms project in the Sierra Nevada. Is that over excuse, $2 excuse me, sir. Could I, could I ask you, do you have a question for Arnie? Yeah. Well, I, I just think these guys are blowing smoke. So um, going back to the idea of thinking about going forward, um, I'm just wondering about your opinion of the feasibility and uh, safety, in particular, of uh, fusion energy. In particular, um, fusion. Fusion. fusion energy. Yeah. Um, when I went to school 40 plus 45 years ago, fusion energy was 10 years in the future. And it seems to always be that. You know, and the, there, there's two issues there's the physics of fusion energy, which is, you know, collapsing hydrogen atoms long enough to get more power out than you put in. And they seem to be approaching that threshold. But uh, I'm an engineer, and, and once you've overcome that threshold, there's a, there are lots of engineering problems. And the, the one that gets me is that the, there's a lot of neutrons sent off, and the containment, the building, um, the, 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 the wires in the building that surround that incredibly hot plasma um, become irradiated with neutrons. And it looked, seemed to me like about every year you were going to have to rebuild this thing. Um, so I, I still think you know, fusion is, is, is way out in the future, and we've got, um, we've got alternatives. You know, in, in my career, we started with 600 megawatt power plants. Then we went to, because they were not, um, uh, they weren't cost competitive. Um, then we went to 800 megawatt, and around 1,000 or 1,100. And, and ultimately, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission put a cap on. They said, we can't, we, we will not license a power plant over 1,300 megawatts. This is back in the, in the 70s, because the growth was going up and up and up because the economics didn't work. And then um, eventually the NRC changed that, and uh, Arriva's come out with a 1,600 megawatt plant, two of which are now like 10 years behind schedule in Europe. Um, and now the industry is saying, well, let's, let's go and build small modular reactors, none of which have been built, but they'll be around 300 megawatts. And now, um, uh, that was, before that, though, Westinghouse came out with an AP 600, 600 megawatts, and that wasn't cost competitive. So then they licensed an AP 1000, which hasn't been operated yet. And then they are now saying, well, we should go small modular. And now Westinghouse just said they're going to make a lead-cooled reactor. So it, it, I call it the little orphan Annie syndrome. It, you know that song, the sun will come out tomorrow. But the cool part about tomorrow is always a day away. And I, and I think that's the, 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 the scam in nuclear, is that uh, if you just give us another 10 years, we'll have a better way. Uh, and um, global warming's not going to take a 20-year vacation. You know, the CO2 is growing at about 2, two ppm a year, maybe even faster. Um, and so if we wait those 20 years and then start to implement a new nuke strategy, you're out at, out at 450 ppm already, and you're just turning on the first power plant. And, and my position is that you just, um, um, when we have uh, inexpensive uh, sources right now, that coupled with batteries um, or, other, or other means of storing that energy are as cost effective. Now, in Texas, um, to, uh, Texas Electric is now giving power away at night. From 9 o'clock at night until 6 in the, in the morning, Power is free because they have so much power from the wind, um, and I and I think that the the, the future is not this uh, is not these massive power plants, uh, but uh, not small modular reactors, but small modular renewables. So, all right. Well, thank you.